Welcome to day two of ACL. I'm Vivek Srikumar, one of your program chairs. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the second of our wonderful keynote speakers today. We have Subbarao Khambampati from the Arizona State University. Um, he's usually called Rao. And Rao is, uh, he's got a distinguished career um, spanning a lot, uh, sufficient time, shall we say. Um, where he's worked on problems on planning and decision making, and along the way he's accumulated a lot of honors. He is a fellow of the AAAI, ACM, the American Society for Advancement of Science, AAAS. I think he's the president of AAAI, and many other things, but I don't want to take up all the time listing his honors. Uh, please join me in welcoming Rao Kamampati. Thank you all uh, for getting up um, so early in, in the morning, and especially for the graduate students among you. Uh, thank you for waking up after the Khosan Road Adventures uh, yesterday night. Um, and then uh, thank you for the organizers. And let's just see. OK. Uh, thank you for the organizers, um, especially Vivek. Um, Andre and um, um, Lin Vee for um, asking me uh, to give this talk. Believe me, I'm just as surprised as you probably are that I got asked. Um, and I will say a little about that. And um, before I go on, in case some of you are wondering, maybe he figured out how to write stuff in Thai. That's actually not Thai. That is Telugu, the language I speak. And I just decided to, because you got the linguistics people, I never got to address a linguistics, um, even computational linguistics crowd. So I thought I, you should see how Telugu language looks. So that's what Telugu version of my talk's title looks like. OK. So how many of you know Betridge Law Headlines? Um, it's basically uh, uh, the law says that if a headline ever ends in a question mark, the answer probably is no. So I, since my title was, uh, Can Large Language Models Plan and Reason with a question mark, you might be worried that he's going to say, it's a no. Why did I wake up so early to listen to this downer of a talk? Uh, in this day and age, in, you know, even in ACLLM, I mean ACL, um, people do not like particularly any balanced views of uh, LLMs. In general, not people, not you general people. And so I want first to make sure that you realize that I'm not here to diss on LLMs. I don't want to be seen as this guy who is kicking a cute puppy and lose all my audience. So I'm all for LLMs. Um, and um, in general, I think that uh, it's sort of like alchemy. Uh, those of you who know alchemy, chemistry is a beautiful science. Alchemy's problem was not that chemistry is not a beautiful science. It is that some people thought chemistry will become nuclear physics if you somehow prompt it just the right way. And that's the problem with alchemy. And I think to some of the worries about LLM's limitations that I'll point out kind of go in that same direction. LLMs are great for what they do, but you people tend to assume that they can also do other things. Um, so in fact, an alternate title that I considered for this talk is LLMs are system ones for humanity at large. And that ought to be enough, really. That's a pretty useful thing. You know, traditional AI has not actually given us a very good system one. And LLMs actually do a pretty reasonable job of that. And, and so it's actually a very positive thing to look at it. But science is all about not deluding yourself about um, you know, what is not possible. So you should know what the technology is good for, as well as what the technology what the limitations of the technology are. And I hope that I will get you to understand some of that in the context of LLMs and uh, planning. Um, in particular, uh, AI at large has become a bit of an ersage natural science that I would like to call. We are gener you know, basically training these huge um, you know, models which we don't really know what they will do. And then we'll poke them and figure out what they do. There's nothing wrong with it. Zoologists do this. They find some you know, animal in some place. They will poke and see what the animal's behaviors look like. 
The problem is we tend not to have very good empirical discipline in doing these kinds of studies. In general, the very first instance of any positive support for your hypothesis, people tend to run and write papers and that might not be as useful. So hopefully that would be something that we will try to um, you know, get, I, I'll try to get across to you. So I'm not here to, I'm here to leverage LLMs, not lament them. Uh, so I come from planning, um, you know, basically planning in, um, you know, classical or deterministic to stochastic domains in terms of optimization matrix of different kinds for plan quality, in terms of whether the models are complete or incomplete or partial, et cetera. These are all the things that I worked on. Um, and then last five, seven years before I got into this LLMs and planning angle, I was working in explainable human AI interaction, um, which basically, and we also have done a bunch of work there, and there's actually a, a manuscript that we wrote, a monograph we wrote called Explainable Human AI Interaction, a Planning Perspective, that's available on the web, on, on archive uh, freely. So you might want to take a look if you're interested in that sort of a direction. Now, of course, you might be wondering, hey, this is all fine, but what's your connection to natural language? understanding and natural language processing. I'm here to tell you that I did take an NLP course with this textbook called Natural Language Understanding. And those of you who know, this is one of the first textbooks in natural language understanding, and it was written by James Allen. That guy looks like that. And what's interesting about him is that he also was the lead author on readings in planning, which is actually my graduate study I was focused on. So one of the interesting things is there was a significant connections at one point of time between planning and natural language and linguistics community, because you guys were interested in understanding, right? Natural language understanding in between there was a lot more interest in natural language processing, information extraction, et cetera, et cetera, summarization, et cetera. And now that LLMs have made that, all that stuff pretty doable, they really, you really get to focus on the more important, interesting stuff, which is understanding and reasoning and planning and so on. Uh, so I'm thinking that this may be restart of a beautiful friendship between uh, natural language understanding and planning. Okay, let's see how it goes. So. The question is, can LLMs plan um, upfront? By the way, the, the slides, in case you want to follow along, some of the slides are quite dense, but you know, I will, in case you want to follow along, um, you can take the slide from there. Um, so can LLMs plan? Um, there's tons of papers, including yesterday's uh, poster session making claims that they can plan, they can actually do planning, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not questioning the reviewing quality because reviewing quality is basically based on people who are, you know, it depends on, you know, you review based on what you know, right? Um, so from my perspective, I thought, I know how LLMs work. I think you know how LLMs work approximately. And, you know, in, in terms of this n-gram model um, you know, and large scale training. And so I, thought basically from the beginning that, you know, large language models are best seen as huge system ones that are trained on the humanities footprints, digital footprints. That's what has been done. We, on the other hand, have both system one and a system two, and we might be essentially converting system two, compiling it into system one, but LLMs don't have a system two, as far as I could see, and they're essentially converting your system two. Whenever there's something like synthetic data, they're converting your system two to their, to this system one. It's a very useful thing to have an amazingly big system one for the humanity at large. Just like Google was great, ChatGPT, et cetera, are great, okay? Um, so I thought they would be very useful idea generators, but they can't do planning. And yet, as I said, all these other uh, papers are being written, especially in, you know, amazing conferences like New Rips and so on. So, you know, a while back, about two and a half years back, I started you know, poking around at it. And this is a more recent example with GPT-4O. I actually started looking at it from GPT-3 onwards. So GPT-4O, I asked this very simple question. Um, by the way, in automated planning community, the fruit fly, the simplest domain that we look at as a planning domain, is stacking a bunch of blocks which are in one configuration in the initial state into a different configuration in the goal state. And that's, and then you have a bunch of actions like stacking, unstacking, and putting up, putting a block on top and uh, picking up, et cetera. So I asked GPT-4, oh, this exact prompt, if block C is on top of block A and block B is separately on the table, can you tell me how I can make a stack of blocks with block A on top of block B and block B on top of block C, but without moving block C? 
That's a trick part. I mean, you guys probably have figured out by now that that can't be done because whatever you do, you will like wind up moving C. The interesting question is, it's just three blocks. What is chat GPT-40 is doing? So there is a trace of that. It hallucinates the specification. It hallucinates the physics. It hallucinates the goal. The only thing it is, is it is annoyingly polite. It's always say, oh, you're right. I'm so sorry. Here is another thing. Oh, you're right again. I made another mistake, et cetera, et cetera. Until I find the right answer. And you know, if I'm a grad student, I'll say, wow, LLM solved the planning problem because I actually spent time looking, correcting until the plan became correct. So I considered LLMs to be very apologetic non-planners. They cannot actually give a correct plan. Okay, uh, so when uh, New York Times actually was doing uh, some write-up on GPT-40, they asked me for some ideas, and I basically gave them this, and so it was on New York Times, so people were actually trying this out separately too. Um, so now, of course, you can't just make claims based on a single um, anecdote. Anecdotes are good to actually get motivated, but if you want to do systematic study, you have to actually do Consider large distribution of problems, you know, check uh, the uh, aggregate performance, et cetera, et cetera. We have done all that. There are bunches of papers there. And uh, so I would not, before going into them, and, and also I gave a two-hour tutorial two weeks back at ICML that's available on the YouTube. That's a longer version uh, with more details and certain things. You might be interested in looking at that. But the, to, cut the, uh, to, to cut to the chase, even now, this is as of June 2024, when Claude 3.5 Sonnet came, and this is, we have this thing called Plan Bench, which is like planning uh, problems, like the blocks world, logistics, et cetera, et cetera. And then we are essentially checking all these guys' performance on over 500 randomly generated problems. And then you will notice that they're pretty bad. Okay, at the blocks world level, maybe it's come on, coming up to below 50 or close to 50. One of the interesting things that I will tell you is with LLMs, when they do something right, you have to ask yourself, are they retrieving the answer approximately or are they actually kind of doing reasoning? And one of the things that we did to check that is change the names so that the planning model remains the same, but the predicate names and the object names are different. This is what's called obfuscation. It's been done in planning community before. Um, I'll tell you that in a minute. And, and then if you do that, the mystery blocks for you notice pretty much all the um, GPTs, all, all the you know, LLMs, you know, state-of-the-art LLMs suck extremely badly. And what's more interesting, very simple strips planners that were done like in 72 by Neil Nielsen and his friends can solve all of them, okay? So it's worth asking yourself, if I want AGI, is this reasonable? Is this actually, you know, actually doing reasoning? And so to get an understanding about this, I want us to have some common ground understanding of what planning is and a couple of you know, points about LLMs. Okay, again, this is one of the um, um, denser slides, but the, the green parts are what I really want you to understand. Planning essentially given a set of objectives, coming up with uh, you know a set of actions to achieve them. You know, hopefully optimally. But these days, nobody talks about optimal. It just looks like a plan is what mostly people are looking at. Standard planning and reinforcement learning too assume that the possible actions are given upfront. And the RL basically tries to learn the action model. Planning assumes the action model is given beforehand. There's a version that I like to call MacGyver planning, where you just give the problem and the planner makes up actions. You know, for those of you from India, this is like Jugard planning, that is making up, you know, actions that never was given beforehand, just to somehow make uh, the problem look. This is actually an interesting ability. We are actually impressed when people can do MacGyver planning. That's why MacGyver is a series. But civilization goes not because of MacGyver plans, but because you have standardized actions that you can guarantee that the plan actually works, okay? NASA is not in the habit of trying to figure out, you know, let's just try to do generic something and, and, and then send a, you know, a mission plan up front. Scheduling is a special class of planning problems where in general, all you're trying to do is look at resource allocation to a set of 
a plan, a actions that have already been decided. And it actually brings forward the notion of interactions between um, uh, different um, uh, objectives. And so this becomes very important. A lot of things that within ACL, as well as New Rips community, people call planning, are actually scheduling problems. When somebody says travel planning, typically they mean actually scheduling. That we'll see. And it turns out LLMs are actually bad at planning and they're worse at scheduling. That's actually the interesting part. Um, and then model-based reinforcement learning is just agent is acting in a hopefully ergodic environment and slowly learns the action models as it goes along. Now, I use the word ergodicity. I hope you, some of you heard about this. An ergodic environment is one where an agent can reach any state from any other state with some positive probability. That means that you will never get stuck and you don't die, essentially. Okay. Planning is really most critical for non-ergodic environments. You need to plan if there is a possibility that you will miss a flight and miss this conference. You need to plan if it's possibly that you will get run over by a bus if you are not actually you know, thought about beforehand. Um, if it is fully ergodic and it's very low cost failures, you can blunder through the world without worrying about plans. It's important to understand because many domains where people say the LLMs do planning actually don't need quote unquote planning because they're made ergodic. Um, one way they can become ergodic is that if you have a simulator for the world that is resettable, then you have converted a non-ergodic an, an, an non -ergodic domain into an ergodic world for you. But remember, simulators are written by people outside of LLMs, okay? Saying that I have a simulator means somebody wrote you a domain model, essentially, and people don't like people giving anything, but simulators are given by people that you have to keep in mind. A robustness is how often does the plan actually work when you try to execute it, okay? In deterministic environment, robustness is really correctness. Is it actually going to achieve the goals when you compete it? The interesting thing is that while traditional AI has looked at traditional planning literature, has looked at correctness very easily, like, you know, if you do these actions, you sh it should reach the goal. An interesting other part is the quality of the plan, which is, for example, if I give you a, a travel plan that involves starting from Phoenix, walking one mile, take biking one mile, you know, skipping one mile, et cetera, et cetera, about 10,000 of these actions until I reach Bangkok and this venue. I can say that that's a correct plan. It actually made me come here, but you would say that's a completely silly plan. It's not a desirable plan at all. So in addition to correctness, people tend to have style considerations about what are reasonable plans and so on. In general planning, uh, community had trouble actually capturing the style considerations. Like, for example, they have used things like hierarchical task network, et cetera, planning, et cetera. But in general, style is a sort of a tacit knowledge task. Oftentimes, basically, you are better off actually learning from the distribution rather than having an external um, you know, formal guarantees. And LLMs actually are extremely good at capturing style. I'll keep repeating this. And the problem is, since style is hard for normal planners, and it's also hard for us, most of us, and correctness is easier for us, we think if LLMs can do style, they might be also doing correctness. That's not true. That's the thing that we will try to understand. And then the last thing I want to say about the planning thing is world models, the way a planning agent verifies the robustness of a course of actions it is has before it actually does it in the world. You can always say, I have a plan, I'll just execute in the world. But if you can execute without dying, then you probably didn't need planning to begin with because it's a very benign world. So if you actually are trying to execute outside, that means either you have a model of the world or you have a simulator of the world. To me, they're equal. Simulators and models are given by outside people, or you learn, the agent learned separately. Okay. And um, the one of the things, so basically they might be given as external models, like VDL model, SMT models, are in, you know, and in fact, I'll make this connection later on that you have a Python interpreter if you're doing code generation and debugging. Python interpreters, by the way, are not written by LLMs, they're written by people. Okay, and they have very strong guarantees that they can take any arbitrary Python code and then tell you what will come out. So they work as an external verifier. So it's a model for the way the Python should be understood, Python language should be understood. Um, for normal language, there is no such thing. World is the interpreter for the normal language. Uh, that's the beauty of natural language, right? But that's the, but we have to realize that. 
So the big unresolved, and so they also they can be learned directly from the agent by trial and error over the real world experiences. The interesting question that people get tripped over is whether LLMs somehow figured out a model, even though you are actually only training them in the next token prediction, maybe they kind of figure it out. There are things that we don't completely understand, and so some people assume maybe part of what we don't understand is they're actually getting the world models. There's already literature showing that that's actually questionable, and I will add to that part. Um, so coming back to the LLM side, I would just say that style versus content and farm versus factuality is something that you want to keep in mind about LLMs. LLMs and generative AI in general captures the distribution of the data on which it's been trained on. Style is a distributional property. Correctness is an instance level property. Getting something, something which is a style machine, a vibe machine, assuming that it'll also be correct, there is no actual guarantee that that would be the case. Um, so correctness and factuality are not guaranteed by LLMs. Style, they capture it better than pretty much any other approach that we had you know, in AI. Civilizationally, we had always thought style is harder than content because for us, style is harder than content. Okay, so anybody can probably write Shakespearean stories, but not in the way Shakespeare wrote those iambic pentameter. Well, come to the now new world where anybody can write beautiful iambic pentameter. The question is, is the story going anywhere? That becomes harder with the LLMs. Okay, so LLMs sort of turned this intuition about style being harder on its head. Uh, and actually style is easy, correctness is hard. And you assume that thing that is hard for you, somebody else can do, you think they can also do the other thing. So if you see a friend who can do integration, you assume they can also do multiplication. That's not true for LLMs. If these LLMs are not your friend, they're just a different thing that you train on next word, next token prediction. LLMs generate things that are basically of the style of the thing that you're looking for. So this is a beautiful example uh, last year, New York Times had an article about a whole bunch of fake travel planning books showed up on Amazon that people were buying because they were cheaper than Rick Steve's travel planning books because they're cash clear. <laughs> that one is cash clear. And they were buying it and they look like, you know, they look like a plan. They also have good pictures, et cetera, et cetera. The plan part, they probably use ChatGPT or something and you read it and say, looks good to me. And you come to Th Bangkok and you will realize that it doesn't work. For example, what for is closed certain days, you know, what Arun may not be open um, at a certain time. And those logistical details matter for actually doing plans. And so people will come back and return all these travel books to Amazon within one month. And this happened. There's a, an article in New York Times about it. This is what you have to think about. My joke is they will give you a wedding plan, but you would be a fool to get married with that wedding plan because the way weddings fail is not because they're not at the high level look like wedding plans, but because certain logistics are not working. The way conferences fail is the same way. So people, organizers made things that you don't think about, you know, to make sure that everything goes according to things. It's boring, but somebody has to do it. The other one point that I want to make is hallucination and approximate retrieval. LLMs are engram models, and so they do not retrieve an index. All they ever do is really hallucinate completions to the prompt. And I find it easier when I tell people to say, think about LLMs as always hallucinating. And sometimes their hallucination aligns with your reality. And in those cases, you kind of you know, pat yourself. Normally, we tend to pat ourselves on the back. We are the most self-centered species. But if we are grad students getting New Rips papers, we want to pat LLM because that's how you actually get the paper, right? Um, prompt engineering does not change this. Whether or not changing the prompt gives the factual completion depends on the prompter knowing enough to tell whether the given answer is the accurate one. In that example, you know, the dialogue I had with LLM about that little block solve problem, I was the verifier. I was basically letting LLM generate ideas and I'm checking whether it's actually a correct plan or not. Okay? And so my probably my most uh, um, substantial contribution to AI discourse is this uh, uh, you know, repurposing of XKCD cartoon, which basically says prompter, the, the impressive reasoning abilities of LLMs all depend on prompter knowing the answer. 
Okay, if you can't tell whether the answer that LM give is correct or wrong, then you are just giving, you basically have no idea whether what LM generator is right. And so either you are the verifier or you have formal verifiers in the loop that make sure that what is coming out is actually not just a reasonable idea, but it's actually correct idea. Since I tend to look like the guy who is not full on 110% into LLMs, even though I actually like them a lot. Um, I don't get startup funds, so I am actually making t-shirts, um, you know, of this thing. And, and in fact, I wore that in the in the in the uh, intro uh, the first day. So I also have the t-shirt here. So you know, obviously, um, I can sell these to you. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm kidding, of course, because I have to split royalties with uh, Randall Munro because he came up with the actual graphic. Anyway, um, so the, this is all a long-winded way of saying LLMs actually can't plan. Okay, so LLMs can't plan in autonomous modes. That means if you just give them the answer and you, you give them prompt and you come up with a plan, you can't just assume that it's correct. Okay, and if it becomes corrected because there is some verifier in the loop that is ensuring it's either the human or some formal verifiers. What's interesting, and I'll get to that in the second part, is pretty impressive, pretty influential are you know, popular ideas like chain of thought, react, fine tuning, et cetera, do not help that much, do not, okay? Because chain of thought, for example, does not learn procedures. When you give it you know, uh, an idea, it basically can, if you know how, if you tell it how to do three and four blocks for problems, it will do better in three, four blocks for problems, but you increase the number of blocks, everybody thinks that problem is similar, it dies still. And this is a general problem with chain of thought. We'll talk about it. Um, and then they cannot improve by self-verification. This is one of those things that people think wrong metaphors about LLMs. They tend to think that computational complexity somehow has any connection to whether or not LLMs can solve a problem easily versus hardly. They're not solving anything. They are essentially guessing based on the training. Right, and it's a very useful guessing, but it's not going to be that if you give it in the prompt a semi-decidable problem, in the prompt a polynomial problem, in the prompt a constant time problem computationally, do you think LLM is going to think a little bit longer before giving the tokens out in, if it is a semi-decidable problem? No, it's essentially just going to give constant time token output. And so if you thought it's somehow connected, and the verification is connected, the computational complexity is connected to the way LLMs work. That's kind of a bad metaphor, and you might want to think about that. Um, and we'll actually show that self-verification oftentimes worsens LLMs performance. As I tell my students, if you don't know what you're talking about, go with your gut instinct. Don't try to question your guest instinct because you're likely to make even more errors. In general, LLMs hallucinate errors that don't exist and hallucinates um, you know, basically errors, uh, make up errors that actually don't, uh, that are present in the, ignore the errors that are present and hallucinate errors that don't exist. And so because of it, self-verification doesn't help them. Um, and then human iteratively prompting is a whole entire problem in terms of clever hands effect that I won't want to go into, but you know, not really, I mean, for planning, I really don't want humans to be in the inner loop at all. Okay. So the thing about the reason why people still think that LLMs actually do planning well, I think partly part of this talk really is to change the way you think about things because I've written papers, we have you know the refereed papers in the same things that you guys write, and not yet in ACL, but new rips, ICML, et cetera. And so I'm trying to get you to think in a slightly different way so that at least you can question my assumptions. So computational complexity of the underlying task has no bearing on LLM guesses that you want to keep in mind. A corollary of that is things like stochasticity, partial observability, et cetera, that make traditional AI solvers become harder and harder don't have a similar impact on LLMs. They can guess the next action for a stochastic environment plan, uh, for a deterministic environment plan, for partially observable environment plan, with same ease and same error rate. There's nothing you know, that they're actually solving the problem. That's what we're keeping in mind. On the other hand, background knowledge is easier for LLMs approximately. The one thing that was actually hard for AI has been that somehow you had to come up with this common sense knowledge and the relevant knowledge for the problems by knowledge engineering, et cetera. LLMs having been trained on the web scale collective knowledge of humanity, they're remarkably better at this. They're pretty good with no guarantees and some brittleness at common sense 
uh, approximately, some domain knowledge, some theory of mind, and pretty good at analogies. It's not like anything else actually comes up, comes up with analogies as well as LLMs do, okay? In addition, of course, they have made NLP part more or less solved, right? In fact, a whole bunch of things, all of you people are now, ACL has become ACLLM, partly because the stuff that you guys were working on, for good reason, seems now actually doable having spent all the time training LLMs already. So why work on information extraction? Let's work on reasoning and planning. That's how I get to be here. Okay, now some positive news. Can LLMs help planning at all? Well, of course they can. LLMs, as I said, are idea generators. How many of you think that you want idea generators in your life? Pretty much all of us like to have idea generators in our life. Um, so traditionally AI systems were better at capturing deep and narrow system two behavior than the broad and shallow system one behavior that LLMs approximate. And to that extent, actually, they're very useful. So you know, the joke there is that Einstein came up with E equal to MC squared in the following way. He was trying MC cube, MC power five, MC power seven, until the janitorial custodial lady came and said, cleaned up the desk and said, now it's all squared away. Now it's all squared away. That's how he found out that it's E equal to MC squared. You might laugh at it, but you have to understand that if you ask anybody, when did they get an idea, one of their brilliant ideas, they never say, I was working at my table and working uh, problem after problem, I got the idea. They're always in the toilet or in dolomites or something, and suddenly it comes. The point is, it doesn't matter where the idea comes from. If it, for it to be math, you need to actually prove that the idea is correct. Both are important. You need to get ideas, you need to actually verify them. In math, there are actually almost two different kind of mathematicians, um, who are, some which are great for ideas and some who are great, much better at, you know, step-by-step -step verification. Gregory Perelman is the second type, Pharma is the first type, right? Um, the other angle that I want you to think about is LLMs are really approximate knowledge sources about everything because we spent all the time up front and trained them on the humanities data. Okay, and, and so there's really nothing on the internet, on the web, at least an explicit knowledge case that they haven't already been trained on. So in the past, in the traditional AI systems, the way you write a system for working on a particular domain is you subject matter experts will be there, you go talk to them, and then the knowledge engineer somehow converts it into some sort of a formal representation. Then, then you know, some system like this, in this case, it will be a system was actually solving it. The interesting thing is LLMs actually made short circuit of a bunch of it. Because instead of asking people, you can just ask LLM, what is the action? What are the preconditions? What are the kinds of ideas? And they're actually good at guessing anything with no guarantees that the guess is correct. Okay, And there's also some irony about this whole thing that if you ask a single friend how to solve a problem, that's cheating, that's not AI. If you take everything every one of us knows, put it on the web, and then train an LLM on it and ask LLM now, that's considered modern AI. That's not cheating anymore. Because it's already been done. You know, Sam Altman paid for the, the cost, and so you get to just use it. OK, so while I said LLMs can't plan, there's a green part. Uh, they can help planning in LLM modulo frameworks. LLMs can support planning and expand the range of planning tasks that actually even you know, traditional AI community has looked at, um, planning community has looked at. Um, LLMs can be used in conjunction with, in particular, of course, sectional solvers, but in particular, I'm more uh, interested in external verifiers um, in an LLM modulo framework. I'll show you a picture up in a minute. Um, with the verifiers doing back prompting. So LLM comes up with a guess for the plan. The verifier says, here are all the wishes. You know, can you try it again? It comes up with a new guess. Is the LLM really understanding what you're telling it? Nobody knows, and even none of us know whether or not LLMs actually understand natural language. They're taking natural language input, but they're not necessarily understanding language the same way we do. But they can at least, this can at least change the next guess, and the next guess may well be correct according to the you know, verifier. Okay, so in the LLM modular framework that I'll show you in a minute, LLMs can play multiple roles. So they can guess plans, they can guess domain models, they can help elaborate the problem specification, and of course they can transfer, translate across formats. Translating across formats is what LLMs are actually very good at, which is why much of information extraction and translation from text to formalish languages has sort of become 
that stuff that you guys used to do and I have written some papers too, none of them can keep up with what LLMs will do out of the box most of the time. So this is basically how this LM module framework kind of looks like. Basically, my idea is that I'll put a large language model in the middle. It's like a big idea generator with all sorts of things. It can help you make the problem specification more elaborate, you know, more, more complete. It can help you actually come up with a domain model that actually is used as the background for the verifiers in the case of planning. If I give the domain model on the plan, there are automated systems that can check if the plan is correct with respect to the domain model. And that's sort of like having Python interpreter. A Python interpreter takes a Python program and expect output and checks whether the expect output comes from this particular program. Okay. Um, and then finally, I have a bunch of um, um, critiques, a band of critiques. And the critiques basically look at what LLM's guess is and try to give, you know, Criticism, criticisms in terms of its correctness, its style, etc. The correctness critiques cannot be played by LLMs. As I said, LLMs cannot do verification, or correctness verification. But the style critiquing LLMs actually can do. In fact, I'll show you examples of a poem paper that we have, which basically we use that to do style criticism because there is no other better approaches than LLMs to begin with. Okay, so that's approximately the idea. Um, if you take something like this, and even if you just take the simplest version of it, which is just one critique, and then you apply it to blocks world. So basically, let the LLM come up with the blocks world plan, and the critique actually checks if it is um, correct or not, and if, it's, if there's any errors, it gives a prompt back uh, to LLM. LLM comes with a new new guess. With just that, within about 15 iterations, the maximum. The, speed, the performance goes from like about 30% for GPT-4 to uh, 82%. So it increases because LLMs are actually good guessers. They're not guaranteed correct guessers. They have a higher density of guessing. Um, and then, in fact, the average number of times they had to go back and forth between the verifier and LLM is only four. This is only true because the verifier knows actually what the correct signal is, whether or not the plan is correct. We'll see in a minute that if, in fact, LLM tries to play the verifier game itself, it actually performs worse because it doesn't know actually what's wrong with the plan. Okay, there is a travel planning benchmark that, that you know, that some people, um, actually I met one of the people uh, who's apparently worked on this. It's from a very different group. This is from NLP community um, interested in planning and they essentially travel planning is like a more scheduling problem. They found independently what we've been saying that GPT-4 actually sucks at scheduling problems. They get only 0.6% accuracy. And uh, we have shown recently that just a preliminary application of LLM modulo ideas to this significantly improves the performance um, yeah, of the correctness, okay? So the problem with the travel plans is not that it can't come up with plans that look like travel plans, but it would not guarantee that they satisfy the constraints, like the budget constraints, that there's actually a hotel by that name, et cetera, et cetera. Those are very important things, okay? The other thing I want to say is LLM modulo kind of, this is a, a position paper that we wrote that uh, got a spotlight um, a paper at ICML that I presented um, at Vienna two weeks back. That's basically the LLM modulo idea. Uh, and it basically sort of unifies all in what I would call a sane uses of LLMs in reasoning problems. If you hear that somebody is using LLMs for reasoning, and if it's actually a non-fake non paper, they probably have used LLMs to generate guesses and verifiers to check if the guesses are correct. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you look at alpha geometry, alpha proof, fun search, they all use LLMs as idea generators with external sound solvers and verifiers. What they do in the extra work that they do is they fine tune the heck out of LLM with significant resources to improve its generation be better. Basically, LLM modulo is a generate test framework. And the soundness of a generate test framework depends on the tester. Completeness of the generate test framework depends on the completeness of the generator, okay? And the efficiency depends on how good the generator is. And LLMs, you know, you can improve that if goodness of the generation by fine tuning. That's the way to look at it. So if you think of program synthesis community, they use LLMs generated code guesses in conjunction with unit testing or Python interpreters. And unit testing, by the way, is a partial verification. Because Python interpreter is a verifier, it takes something in Python and tells you what will come out, and including errors, and then it basically can check whether or not this is the expected output. And if a piece of code satisfies all the unit tests, 
if it fails some of the unit tests, you know already that it's not correct code. If it satisfies, it may still fail. That's what happened to CrowdStrike probably uh, a couple of weeks back. But that's the same way of using LLMs, where you actually generate the guess, but you have uh, like a verifier. Uh, and in this particular case, the verifier was basically Python interpreter plus unit tests. Uh, so I was in tongue in cheek. I was saying that any sane way of doing LLMs in reasoning is LLM modulo. Uh, external verifiers, and you can try to convince me uh, that I'm wrong, either at the end of the talk or the rest of the two days I'll be here. Okay, the other important thing I want to mention about LLM modulo is the, the basic structure can be recursively applied. So for example, we can use similar LLM modulo structure to actually come up with a better domain model. Um, a domain model, you can tease it out of the LLM itself. So we have a new RIPS paper, for example, uh, that shows how this can be done by just asking LLM, what are the actions in this domain? What are the preconditions? What are the effects? And then you can try to correct uh, part of it with either manual, partly manual intervention, and partly formal syntactic checks, and so on. And that essentially is you're generating a a model is like a program. So you're generating a PDL program for this domain uh, using LLM module framework. And so that's a, there's more details on that in your paper that you can look up. Um, so that's sort of the summary of LLM module. A couple of things I want to mention here is they're really playing, LLMs are really playing a host of constructive roles. They can generate candidate plans, candidate plans, not correct plans. They can, gen they can be an approximate source of models driving the correctness critiques. They can act as style critiques. I'll show you in a minute. They can help collating the criticisms from the critics, basically the meta controller in, in our framework does that. Of course, they can help with format change. If different uh, critics use different formal languages, then the format change conversion is something that LMs can help with. One thing that we do is I have a preference for critiques over solvers, because solvers tend to come with verification plus search, and that kind of ties you down to the expressiveness limitations of the solvers. Critiques are verifiers are essentially composable, so you can add more constraints and then more critiques that handle those constraints, and that's a much better way of doing it. And the other thing is there is human intervention, but it is minimized. Um, there is only once per domain human intervention in teasing out the domain model, once per problem in specification elaboration, and humans are not required to be in the inner loop of the back prompting search. In general, if you ever find yourself correcting what LLM is saying in terms of the plans, you should have a life. You should not be, life is too precious to be in the inner loop of a planning search, okay? That's what you want to think about. Now, one last thing I want to say about this before going into the limitations a little bit more in detail is LLM Marjolo, I, you know, I know that all of you would just say, I used LLM, I got a paper. But you know, I'm an old guy. I want to actually not be laughed at by people who know better. And you know, is Rav just adding LLMs just to get a paper? Or is this actually needed? Is it, in fact, adding something to the traditional planning technologies? And the argument that I have is they actually help make the scope of planning much more wider. Because originally, we used to have this idea that we'll come up with a planner that specifically looks at a very narrow set of um, in representational constraints for which it guarantees correctness and soundness. It's better to take whatever the customer has and try to do the best you can in terms of providing the guarantees of accuracy. That's what LLM Modulo does. does. Uh, those of you old enough might know this particular paper called Two Thesis of Knowledge Representation by John Doyle and Ramesh Patil, which basically makes the same argument for knowledge representation in general. Um, that you know, people in the old days, knowledge representation people were only looking for tractable knowledge representations, and then focus on them as against uh, as against uh, um, taking any knowledge that is available and try to do the best influence they can. And these guys were arguing against it, and that's basically my argument for LLM modulo too. Okay. In the remaining part, so I think I kind of gave you the main two parts, which is that LMs have limitations in coming up with the plans and, and that they actually can be used very constructively in the LLM modular framework. In the remaining part, I want to give you a little bit more actual details about really LLMs have limitations in coming up with planning because I'm assuming that most of the people here have trouble believing that, especially people of a certain young age uh, who tend to think LLMs can do everything. 
Okay, so in, you know, as I said, GPT-3, we tried this uh, two and a half years back. It was doing extremely badly. We wrote a paper saying large language models still can't plan. That became pretty popular because at that time, every, people thought you know, everything was doable by LLMs. Then GPT-4 came, AGI Sparks came, and we were interested in seeing whether GPT-4's AGI Sparks will do any better on these block solve problems. And then we did a you know, more systematic study in terms of different prompting strategies, zero shot versus one shot, um, direct natural language prompt versus PDL prompt, everything that reviewer two will ask for because we actually have a spot rate paper in Europe, right? And then the plan generation results basically say that GPT-4 slightly improved performance in blocks world, normal blocks world. Um, logistics, it didn't. It's actually still pretty bad. But I was hard to please. I was wondering, are LLMs retrieving based on the names they are, are, are they actually reasoning? That means between GPT 3.5 and GPT 4, there may be more information that's on the internet that they may have used in training or other things. So the question is, are they better at approximate retrieval over blocks world? Are they actually good at reasoning? Okay, and to do that, it's actually hard to do that normally because it turns out that reasoning and retrieval cannot be told apart at face value. If I ask you a question, you give me the answer. I can't tell whether you reason from first principles or actually just remember the answer from because from your friend told you. Especially because you guys are very smart. When I ask you the question, even if you know the answer, you will take three minutes, think like this, and then give the answer that you already marked up beforehand. So you can't tell at face value whether actually the reasoning or retrieval is happening. So in fact, in planning domain, there was this idea called mystery in changing the names of the actions and uh, you know and the predicates and, and objects, so that anything that was a domain specific planner would be shown to be you know cheating. Right. So I was. We did the same thing for the LLM. We essentially change the mystery block, the blocks world. Instead of picking up block, we will say attack object. Unstacking a block from top of another block, we say feast object from another object. So change the names. And as Shakespeare said, a block by any other name would stack just as strong. In logic, names of the predicates and the objects don't make any difference. It's the same logical system. In particular, both these domain models can be solved equally easily by any classical planner. LLMs, on the other hand, just die, ignominious death on the, um, on the, on the uh, obfuscated problems. And I know that the younger people are trying foul, saying this is not fair. You know, people will have trouble too. In general, I don't understand this idea that LLMs are supposed to be AGI, they're going to be superhuman, but they're supposed not to be criticized if they're making errors that people also make. I don't understand that. But it turns out that people, while people like to, you know, um, slide by with their system one, we do have a system two and we use it if our life depended on it, right? So in particular, we did these experiments where we paid Turkers some money saying, you know, your correctness of your answer increases your bonus. And all of a sudden, they started using the system too. We tried giving extra money to LLM. It didn't seem to help. You know, I think, I think you know, Altman is a little richer, but LLMs are not doing any better. So that's the paper in uh, New Rips, and there's a benchmark paper also. Um, so that 2023 is the ancient history. How are the latest LLMs faring? I showed you that. This is as of June uh, 20, 2024. They're just as bad on these obfuscated domains, showing that they're actually not doing reasoning. And so if any of you find that sometimes it does planning, sometimes it makes errors, it's because it was never supposed to be doing planning to begin with. It's essentially you are giving it credit when you wound up checking the plan and found it to be correct and taking points away when it was actually wrong. How about chain of thought prompting? There is Buddhism, there is Hinduism, there is Christianity, and there's chain of thought, which is another religion, okay? Um, people tend to think that it's like the most amazing thing. It slices, it dices, everything, etc. So, well, unfortunately, there's this old guy called John McCarthy, who, what is chain of thought trying to do? It, the idea is it give you advice in addition to just what problem. You want to give an exemplar about how to solve an instance of the problem, and chain of thought is supposed to figure out how to do this more. Right? Taking advice is actually AI complete. There's this old guy called John McCarthy that you may have heard of who said the goal of AI, one goal of AI is advice taker program. So you could be, you wouldn't be surprised that I was surprised that people were thinking chain of thought is a panacea. Okay? Um, it turns out actually chain of thought does not learn procedures. 
So if you tell it how to solve block solve problem for three, four blocks on different distributions, it does better for the three, four blocks, and it falls down as the number of objects increase. That's not what people who understand procedures do, okay? If you think, well, this is some kind of a planning gobbledygook, you take last letter concatenation that all the grad students here know because they have read chain of thought paper, right? So last letter concatenation is given K words, take the last letter of each of the words and then make a string out of it. So the original claim to fame of COT is that they basically upfront GPT-4 wasn't solving it, but then they gave a COT prompt for three, four words and it started doing better on three, four, five words. They should have checked whether it also does on six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, et cetera, up to 20 words. Most of you can do it, even if I give you 20 words and you can come, you know, do last year concatenation. You can see from those pictures that it dies, essentially. So my joke is, uh, you know, the way you teach LLM is give an LLM fish and feed it for a day. Teach it how to fish two fish and feed it for two days. Teach it how to fish three fish and feed it for three days. Teach it how to fish four fish and four, teach it, you know, feed it for four days. And this is a very boring way to teach anybody. If I have a grad student who requires this kind of teaching, I would fire them. Um, I would probably also fire elementary school students who can't do this. And we still are giving credit. Again, they're useful for just that particular small distribution, but they don't generalize over the procedure. I'm not making this up. This is uh, Dale Schurman, who's one of the original authors of the COT paper. He gave an invited talk at ICAPS, which is my planning conference, which unfortunately I didn't get to attend this time. Somebody tweeted, essentially, you know, Dale Schurman saying, Rav was right, and my only comment is Rav still is right, because COT still does not actually learn the procedures. React is another variation of it. It doesn't do any better. There's actually more information on that. There's a paper. In one particular, React actually has this whole mythology about think tag. It turns out that's somewhat questionable. It doesn't really matter where you put the think tags. They don't seem to make any difference. There's a paper that you can look it up. Um, fine tuning, you shouldn't be surprised that fine tuning is good for Essentially, for the three, four blocks, if you give a lot more three, four blocks problems, then it might do better in three, four blocks. It won't do five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten blocks because it doesn't know how to do length generalization. It's not a learning procedure. It becomes even more obvious in the fine tuning. Inability to learn procedure generalizing hobbles fine tuning just as much as it does chain of thought. In general, actually, I tend to think of it as, you know, like this sarcastic way that the good old fashioned AI way of solving a block solve problem is take the domain model, take a combinatorial search problem, planner, have the planner solve the problem and be done with it. But that's considered good old fashioned AI and new lips won't give you a paper. Lama, on the other hand, is get the domain model, get a combinatorial search planner, make a trillion block solve problems, make the planner solve them all, fine tune GPT-4 with the problems and solutions, alternately index the trillion solutions in a vector DP and call it RAG, have the fine tuned RAG GPT-4 guess the solution for the given problem, ensure the correctness, of the guess with an external validator, and if by any chance you actually do slightly better, write a new lips paper. This basically is a way of thinking about um, um, fine tuning in the sense it's a memoization idea, and the question is whether the time you spent in memoizing is it actually being paid for by outside, okay? In general, this is a very useful slide for people from machine learning communities, and, and many of you are also machine learning by proxy. In versus out of distribution is irrelevant if you're thinking about reasoning problems. What matters is deductive closure, okay? So in particular, fine tuning helps a reasoning problem over a small distribution to a retrieval problem on that distribution. But to say it is reasoning, you need to increase the number of words or number of blocks and say that it actually is able to use that advice and that doesn't happen. I'm not the only one who's saying this. Yejin Choi, for example, used some $150,000 to fine tune the heck out of uh, uh, GPT-3 or 4 to do better than 4 by 4 digit multiplication. It got all the way up to 98%. I don't know why you want a 98% accuracy on 4 by 4 digit multiplication when I can buy a cheap calculator in, in Khoisan district, right? But you give it 5 by 5, it dies back to zero. That's the point about procedure learning, okay? Um, fine tuning with derivational traces is a new idea that people are trying that also has similar problems. The last thing I would probably have time to talk about here is can LLM self-critique? It turns out, as I said, they actually cannot. So the paper, we basically look at game of 24, graph coloring and planning problems. And we consider both LLM generating the guess and critiquing the guess itself versus LLM generating the guess and an external critique it is you know, verifying it. And when LLM actually checks its own answers, its performance worsens. 
and you can understand that in terms of false hallucinations in terms of what is wrong with uh, it, it basically it tries to figure out what is wrong with you know a, a solution in the wrong way so in fact if any time you find llm gives a correct answer to anything do the following thing i say are you sure i thought it's the other way around and most llms will say sorry i thought strongly you are right and they will agree with your misguided prompt the point is you never do that you stop as soon as it's correct and then give it full credit i don't quite know how this works in fact humans are not good at giving credit to anybody but as i said it's giving credit to llms is a good way to get you know new lips papers okay so why the divide in self critiquing claims why are people still writing papers on this well the idea is the confusing style versus correctness for style llms are actually the only game in town for correctness there is basically formal verifiers are much better um so in fact there is a colm paper that's coming out from our group which essentially uses llms as a behavioral critiques on the robot behaviors to see the correct behavior is it still of the correct style is it something that people would be happy with okay and that actually is a good way to use llms for criticism so you have to ask yourself are they verifying style in which case there is no other comparison or are they verifying correct you can also use we also use them in um, hri there's a paper on how you can use llm as a proxy for humans and see whether or not the plan would be considered explicable or not by humans outside it's a sort of a simulator of what humans might say and it's a reasonable approach for that because that's another of the style issues that points up working um so actually the reason one other reason why people still consider this planning um they can do planning is partly as i said they confuse reasoning with retrieval and the in general planning has planning knowledge and the interaction resolution and llms are good at planning knowledge they can make up approximate planning knowledge and approximate plans but they are not good at interaction resolution okay to check whether that's correct we actually did this experiment where we took blocks world and then removed the preconditions and removed the delete list so that pretty much any arbitrary concatenation of subplans will work that is basically the domain where planning is not needed llms do better there okay so as you increase the number of interactions they wind up worsening and so that's actually kind of a good strong thing that many times people issue make claims about reasoning abilities planning abilities it's basically because of this um uh, in, they're actually ignoring the interactions and the interactions are not needed in that particular domain so i would say that if you want to argue that llms can plan pk domain with a very high branching factor of unenumerated actions where the interaction interactions are low and nobody cares about whether the plan is correct or not llms can do as good a job as anybody okay on the other hand if you want to argue that llms can't plan pk normal a domain with the enumerated actions but the action interactions are non trivial and you actually need to ensure correctness and then they fail completely okay by the way things like top k plans don't make sense saying that llm has the answer in the top k doesn't make any sense i have the top two answer for every true false question in the world useless somebody has to check which answer is correct okay uh doesn't copilot or code show that llms can plan actually no as i said already copilot has humans in the loop first of all and secondly it has python interpreter which actually works as a partial verifier and the github data is much cleaner than the general web data talk to me when there is a fourth chan for github then i will know what happens about uh, you know generated plans and finally most effective approaches for automated programming as i mentioned are really llm modulo approaches the last thing i probably want to say is with all this i am little worried i don't know about you about the new agentic llm gold rush and frenzy because if they can't actually plan why are we just saying they can be useful in agentic systems the idea normally is because they can do external function calls that's like leaving a gun in the home because the toddler knows how to hold the gun that's not a smart thing because toddler doesn't know how to plan to use the gun right in fact nobody probably should have a gun that's a different story but this is the kind of thing that i'm worried about in general that ai safety is really llms just randomly you know in calling outside functions without having any guarantees about what is likely to happen so that's where i'm going to more or less end and say this is llm modulo framework i would basically skip over a bunch of slides uh, and then just say 
that is both red and green. Red is that don't delude yourself that they can do things that they can't do. And the green is that they can actually be used in quite significantly useful ways in planning. Uh, and, and the role of um, large language models in planning is a two hour tutorial, a more detailed one that you can look up. And remember what I said, I'm not against LLMs, even though I may have kind of bust some of your bubbles. I'm actually very positive about them because we never had a good system one. We had system twos for narrow domains, never a system one, and they're extremely useful from that perspective. Thank you for giving me this chance.